Okay, great. So uh, welcome everyone. Um, this is our um, public talk on Christianity and uh, we are very uh, glad, I'm very appreciative uh, that Jim Borrell and Richard Elwood are here to help us through the night. And Robert, uh, feel free to jump in. Um, so I think we're pretty lucky to have uh, these participants from the Liberal Catholic Church. So take it away. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, the name Liberal Catholic literally means universal freedom. Liberal is freedom, Catholic is universal. So we have a perhaps a wider outlook than some churches. The Liberal Catholic Church came into existence in 1917 with the consecration of Bishop, the founding Bishop James Ingalls Wedgwood. Wedgwood had been in Anglican orders, but because he went to hear a lecture by Mrs. Besant, the, rick, the vicar of the parish he was serving in asked him to leave, leave the Anglican church. So he did. And then he became the general secretary of the TS in England after that. And after a while, he left that and became the representative of the Supreme Council of International Co Freemasonry. He entered into correspondence with Bishop Arnold Matthew on birds. <laughs> Bishop Matthew was the Archbishop of the Old Catholic Church in England. Old Catholics were congregations that objected to the papal in, in what's the word, uh, encyclical that said the Pope was infallible in ecclesiastical matters. There were old Catholic churches in each country in Europe and they were organized by country. The old Catholic Church of, ne of the Netherlands uh, sent Bishop Matthew to England to uh, form congregations there, essentially to be a missionary. Uh, and he met Bishop Wedgwood, or Wedgwood was not a bishop at that point. And they started forming a congregation in London. And then uh, Bishop Matthew decided to return to the Roman Catholic Church where he had originally been from. And so they, the old Catholics had to elect a new Bishop for England and Wedgwood was elected. He was known all over the British Empire at that time through TS circles and through Masonic circles. Um, he decided to go to Australia on ostensibly on Masonic business. But while he was there, he met Bishop Wed Ledbeater, excuse me, who wasn't a bishop then either. He was an Ang Anglican priest who had left the Anglican order to follow HPB to India. Bishop uh, Wedgwood consecrated Leadbeater, and then together they worked on creating a liturgy for us, for the church. Leadbeater being clairvoyant brought all that ability to the formation of the liturgy. He felt that the, that the Roman church's liturgy was um, detrimental in that it was asking God for mercy and saying we're poor sinners, we can't help ourselves, you know, and things like that. He said it cast sort of a gray pall over this congregation during the service. So they re removed those things from, this, from the liturgy and uh, reorganized it a little bit. Afterward, Ledbeater wrote the book, The Science of the Sacraments. And uh, Michelle has an illustration from it that she can show us. Would you show it now, Michelle? Want to show it? Yep. Yeah. There we go. 
So Leibniz says that the liturgy actually forms this structure that we see in the inner worlds. In the, if you can see the illustration, the church is only about, the, the physical body of the church is only about an inch tall. And uh, the rest of it is in etheric and astral matter, probably. But Leibniz said that the, the liturgy uh, takes the human efforts and combines them with efforts from the angelic kingdom to build this edifice. And the purpose of the edifice is to spread a blessing upon the world. Uh, he said at the closing, at the conclusion of the mass, this, the structure, the doors of the temple open and all the energy that has been used to create this form is spread into the community. The liberal Catholic Church offers the seven universal or the seven sacraments of the universal Catholic Church. Those sacraments are baptism, confirmation, absolution, holy communion, holy matrimony, holy unction, and holy orders. But it doesn't ask its congregants to accept any dogma. Freedom of thought is one of the primary tenets of the church. We also have open communion to all people who approach our altar with reverence. You don't have to be a member of the liberal Catholic church or any church. Don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to, you can be an agnostic. Uh, whoever approaches the altar with reverence can have communion. We are governed by a synod composed of all the LCC bishops in the world and not by the Roman Catholic Pope. We don't have any, any formal connections with the Roman Catholic Church. Our holy orders, however, are recognized as valid by the Roman Church. So the people who are baptized in our church are considered baptized in the Roman Church. Our clergy are all, are all volunteers, and they may marry or not as they see fit. Our liturgy is always in the language of the people of the country. And we do not proselytize. Bishop Ledbier wrote, the Holy Eucharist has hitherto been regarded as a means of grace to the individual. That it is undeniably. He says, but I wish to show with all reverence, it is much more than that. There's also a plan for helping the evolution of the world by frequent outpourings of floods of spiritual force. We have teachings, but we allow our congregations to interpret these ideas how they see fit. The teachings are of the existence of God, of the Holy Trinity, the ministry of Christ, the nature and the destiny of man, man's ethical relations with himself and with others, and about the church and the sacraments. So I got into this sort of the way Leadbeater did. <laughs> I, uh, I was visiting a friend in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I was staying at his house over the weekend also on Masonic business. And uh, Sunday morning after breakfast, he converted his living room into a church, mm -hmm. built an altar. And he says, can you help me? I said, okay. So we were setting up the altar, putting the candles out and everything. And finally says, here, put on this cassock and wear this. And when I ask for the wine and water, you can bring it up to me and things like that. So that's how I got started in the church. I didn't know much about it other than what I'd read in a few theosophical publications. But the, uh, the energy outpouring from that altar was just amazing to me. Mm. And uh, it was a real blessing, I thought. So, so I've been doing that since uh, the mid 1970s. Uh, I had a hiatus for a while while I was living in Delaware because there wasn't a church operating near me. But uh, 
it's been a lot of fun and interesting and I've met some very wonderful people. And so I'll continue. Okay, Richard. Okay. Oh, thank you. So I'm, I'm Richard, or I could be called Father Richard in the context of the church. Um, so I got involved right here in Ojai. When I moved to Ojai, uh, originally I moved into Crotona and um, a few months or so, I think it was after I arrived, um, uh, Father Jim came to me and said, say, uh, would you be interested in, in coming to uh, serve at the church? And I had been there a few times because my father was is a priest was a is now a retired priest from our parish here in Ojai and uh, um, I had found it appealing uh, so I thought I'd go ahead and get involved and um, and after only a few uh, a few Eucharists being involved in a few Eucharists I really fell in love with the the beauty of the altar and of the music. And I really enjoyed all the, the pomp and ceremony of the, um, uh, of the ceremony itself. And um, found it to be a very interesting and compelling thing to try and learn about what all the nuances and all the different aspects of the ceremony were. And I kept volunteering and very gradually I moved up through minor orders um, and then uh, became cleric and eventually uh, uh, was ordained a priest. And uh, so I'm still very happy to continue volunteering and uh, continuing to I would say continuing to be a student of Christianity. Um, the more I learn about it, the more it seems I really don't know that much about it. So it's a constant learning experience and uh, it's been a very fulfilling and important part of my life. Um, so I've been very happy to be involved. I've also been very, um, very much struck by the power of the of the eucharist and it, the, its ceremony that that really uh uh knocked me down uh, metaphorically uh when i i really was able to to let it into my heart so that's pretty much my my story as far as how i got involved in the church um so maybe we could uh um, open this up to any questions that any of you might have about the liberal Catholic Church or even uh, to understanding Christianity in general and any thoughts or reactions uh, you have to what you've learned so far. Thanks. Um, I guess I, I would start with just something general. Can you um, touch on the practice, like the daily practice, either of you as priests in it or of your congregation? Are there, you know, I know you don't have dogmas, so you don't have rules, but is there something that you encourage? Is there a prayer or a, um, a meditative, contemplative type mm -hmm. practice that that is offered? Well, of course, uh, the most central practice is the weekly Eucharist itself. Um, and of course, we encourage and invite everyone who, who is interested to come and attend. Um, the service involves uh, many different prayers, uh, all, all arranged in a specific ceremony. Uh, and the, the climax of which is the, um, the consecration of the host. Um, and the host, uh, if you don't know, is a little round uh, wafer or cracker. 
and um, it's consecrated in which we invite the, 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 the spirit to move directly into that host. And that host becomes then charged with this divine and spiritual force. And then, of course, we offer communion, which is where we take that, we, we give those charged particles to the people in the congregation to lift their spirit and fill themselves with that charging spiritual force. Um, we also have other ceremonies that we perform. Uh, we haven't lately because of the COVID, back, COVID situation, but uh, regularly in the past, we have on Wednesday nights offered um, a solemn benediction. And that's a, ser a, a service in which uh, we take um, a host that has been consecrated and put it in uh, a device called a monstrance. And that um, gives it a, uh, um, I don't know, it sort of uh, frames it in a, in, a, in a vessel that can allow it, the host to be presented visibly to the world. And we hold up that monstrance and point it around uh, the congregation and the idea being a, 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 an outflow of spiritual energy pours forth out of the monstrance and into the members of the congregation. And in fact, I like to think far beyond the boundaries of the church that that spiritual energy bursts forth into the world and surrounds the world with that loving godlike energy and that's a very important uh, counterpoint to the eucharist where the eucharist is where the energy is brought in and charged and the benediction is where it is poured out into the universe thank you thank you, you um, also can... no go ahead Jim. Oh, i was going to say uh in, a, in addition to those, there are daily services that people can, can do. Uh, there's a morning service called Prime and an evening one called Compline. And there's a midday service called Sect um, that individuals can do on their own at home. Uh, and then also every week there are uh, specific gospel readings and, and specific epistles that people can look at and, and think about in, in the week. I know I have to do it when I give a sermon because <laughs> we have to we have to relate it to those. But uh, uh, it's interesting, and, and and the year is all divided up into different seasons, and and they have correlations to the astrological year as well. Uh, what the intents of the Sundays are. Uh, But yeah, it, that's essentially it. <laughs> so, so would it be fair? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. if it is on the same thing yeah. that he said. So would it be fair to say, or my understanding that most of the practice of the church is around like church ceremonies from what I remember growing up? Does that make sense? Well, it is for me. I, I mean, each person can have a different approach, but that's certainly mine. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think we um, might also, pardon me. I was gonna say, I think we might also mention the healing sacrament, which is a part of our worship mm -hmm. also. Uh, when we had the benediction on Wednesday evening, once a month, we also had uh, healing at that time. And on another Sunday, we would have it after the morning Eucharist. And persons who wish to receive spiritual healing can come up and kneel at the altar, receive an injunction of, um, of chrism or oil and laying on of hands uh, for healing of mind and body. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank that, you. That's yeah. true. And of course, it's important to remember that we don't, we wouldn't think that the priest uh, who is performing that healing is in fact doing the healing. The priest is really just a vessel through which the healing angel uh, can use as a conduit 
uh, to, to bring that healing energy to the person who's receiving it. Okay, Pablo. Yeah, so you also have some kind of ceremonies to, to clear, let's say, the atmosphere in places where people may feel that there are unpleasant influences. Is there a, uh, I think there is a ceremony that you can do, isn't there? Well, there's, there's house blessings. Yeah. We can do a house blessing. Uh, it doesn't have to be because there's unpleasant things, but uh -huh. <laughs> it's designed to help with that if there is some. Um, there, uh, we can bless objects. Uh, usually when, when I do a baptism, the family has some little necklaces and things for the child that we bless beforehand. But uh, yeah, that's mainly it. Um, yeah. yeah. Can, can I ask a question? Okay. Yes. What, um, so did, did the liberal Catholics split from the Catholic church um, or, you know, it wasn't even, it wasn't even that it was just something totally separate and called itself a liberal Catholic church. What, what similarity do you follow with the Catholic church? You are calling yourself the liberal Catholic church. So you have some tie to them. What's the really strong common bond? I, I guess you could, maybe it is the Eucharist. I don't know. Yeah. Well, there's, what's, there's, what's the strong difference that you're? So there's there's two two ways that we're uh, joined to them in that we uh, we all perform the seven sacraments: baptism, confirmation, communion, and so forth. Uh, the other thing is through the apostolic succession, which is the lineage uh, from Christ down to, down to the present day, through specific individuals who've been consecrated uh, and prepared to receive that um, consecration. So, so we share orders with them. Our, our, our church orders actually diverged from the Roman church back in the, um, I think around 1750 probably in the Utrecht uh, mm -hmm. with uh, the church there. The people in, U at, in Utrecht wouldn't accept the bishops that Rome was sending to them. And finally, <clears throat> finally, uh, they, I can't remember Bishop Bartlett, but I can't remember even all the circumstances of it. But anyway, they kind of diverged from the Roman Church then, and then then the old Catholic Church came into being uh, around seventeen. I mean, around eighteen sixty. Uh, old Catholic Church of Holland and and other countries. And then, uh, yes, Robert wants to speak, I oh. think. Yeah, well, that's uh, fine. I just would want to emphasize that it, I, I think it would be a misstatement to say the liberal Catholic Church split from the Roman Catholic Church. Most of the founders of it, as we just heard, uh, Ledbetter, Wedgwood, and so on, had actually been Anglican priests, not Roman Catholic. So if anything, its roots are more in the Church of England, the Anglican Church, than the Roman Catholic. The, and um, I myself was raised in that tradition as an Episcopalian. And we made, in my growing up, quite a bit out of the idea that the word Catholic should not be restricted to the Roman Catholic Church, but includes also the Anglican, the Eastern Orthodox, and for that matter, the Lutherans and some others say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the Apostles' Creed. So uh, as Jim said earlier, the word Catholic really means universal. It means the church everywhere, but it takes different forms in different times and places. And I think the liberal Catholic Church should be seen in that context. I have a question. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Um, when you're drawing down the power and you're uh, infusing the, the participants at, at the mass with the, you know, the divine energy, is it meant to be just a general infusion of divine energy or 
over the many attendances at the mass, there are some specific, um, uh, what's the right word? Um, changes you're trying to have occur in the, uh, in the members of the church? I think, I would say it's more general rather than that we are trying to cause a progression of changes to occur in any specific order or sequence. I mean, of course, the ultimate goal, as I see it, um, is, to, is to do Christ's work, to try to bring the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And by infusing the congregation with the spiritual power, bit by bit, tiny movement by tiny movement, mm -hmm. we can work towards that goal. Okay, and do you, can you um, just give us an indication of um, the size of the liberal Catholic church, you know, um, oh, are there so, X amount of parishes or is it only in certain countries? Yeah, uh, well, the short answer is small. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're in about 40 countries okay and uh i mean that varies a lot uh our fat our greatest growth right now is in africa uh in west africa um but we initially when lead beater was alive of course it, it spread quite rapidly through sure. the tf countries the English and the Dutch colonies and, uh, and back in England and Holland. Uh, but there's a pretty strong contingent in France right now also. Um, I don't know about South America, but um, there are churches in Brazil, certainly, and Colombia. Uh, Argentina too. Cuba, <laughs> Argentina, certainly, yes. Yeah, Bishop Batet is there. Is each, um, Jim, does each country really, um, they have a bishop in charge of the country or is there an overarching uh, um, organization uh, involving all the countries on somewhat of a global level? Yes, yes, to both. both? Yeah, there, okay. there, there's a priest in charge of each country and then we have the, bishop. the yeah. presiding archbishop um, who incidentally lives here in Ojai, who's in charge of the worldwide organization. Well, but he, he's like chairman of the board. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's a, uh, a general Episcopal Synod that really you know, prepares the rules, considers any changes in liturgy, uh, all that sort of thing. Uh, there's a, a bishop in, in charge of, of the countries where we have churches. He's called a regionary, and uh, then, the, then the bishops all together come, come together every five years, I think it is, to have a, a general Episcopal Synod, it's called, uh, where they meet for a better part of a week. Um, I, I attended one, not as a bishop, because I'm not a bishop, but uh, I was invited to one in St. Albans, England, one year, and... Uh, it's, it's really powerful to be sitting in a church with 30 bishops uh, <laughs> sitting there off the croziers and a very powerful ceremony. Um, but yeah, did we answer your question, Doug? Yeah, and I just have one last one. Um, when I think of drawing down power, I think of that vehicle being used for the Western bodies because they're, they're um, cycle a lot denser than like the eastern body. So, are, are, does the church also operate in, say, China or those, you know, that type of uh, uh, country where they, you know, you have a total different uh, psychic body, or is it more fit for for Western bodies? Well, we have a church at Adyar. Okay. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only one in India, but there is one there. Um, 
it's not widespread in, in Asia. Uh, it used to be in Indonesia and Java, certainly, when the Dutch colony was there. Um, yeah, that's that's all I know of. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. The Philippines, mm -hmm. uh, um, Elena, do you know, is it common in the Philippines or the church, liberal Catholic church? No. No, Philippines is maybe 90% Catholic, Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. You're right, yeah. Okay, yeah. Maria, did you have a, a comment or question? I have um, a question for Anine. I know she's a server in the LCC here. And I'm wondering about I'm wondering about her impressions of the church and how it feels to be a server. Um, I, when I was about 14, I, I went to the Liberal Catholic Church and I have been going ever since. Um, I have realized what a tremendous feeling it, it does or it gives to the person who is the um, celebrant. I have seen uh, in my brother and <clears throat> various friends, how the service itself affects them, um, perhaps emotionally, in a very beautiful way. Um, as a woman, I, I know that they've often said, you know, why aren't there any women uh, asked to be uh, priests or something like that? And I can tell you, I'm not interested in being in that position. There's certain things that men just have to do, and if that's what, it, <laughs> that's fine. You're such a chauvinist, Anine. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I am. <laughs> well, yeah. and, but, but I do appreciate to be able to serve in a church, and I was. Um, um, it happened when a, fr a dear friend of mine passed away, and Jim was going to do the requiem mass for her. And he didn't have anybody to help him. So he made me a server. And yeah, I've been helping whenever they need me. Um, I, I don't go and push myself into the situation. It's only when they need me because I've seen this ceremony for nearly 70 years. So <laughs> it, it's very well known to me. I can even see when they make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Quite often. Um, it was, it, it was my understanding, um, and please correct me, that there are certain ceremonies that um, a male energy can uh, be a, a better conduit um, or less restriction. And there are ceremonies where the same is for a female energy or, you know, that the energy moves through. Is that, did I make that up? Well, I've heard two things about that. Uh, the first is that um, females are better in ceremonies where the, the deity or, or the saint or whoever is being venerated is a female. Uh, and conversely, men are, are better suited for those where, where it's a male figure that's being venerated. The other thing I've heard I have no idea if this is if it's true or not. But I have to be psychic to know. Uh, they say that that the Ida and Pingula uh, parts of, of our serpent fire or Kundalini are reversed in males and women and females, and and that the the ordination ceremony is set up for the male arrangement of, of Ida and Pingula. Okay. So that's all I know about it. But I mean, there are churches that ordain women. Ours isn't one of them. But um, I think I think we're holding back uh, because we don't want to be seen as anti-Roman, <laughs> uh, or or to have uh, people who are baptized by us not 
have their baptism accepted by the Roman church because it's been performed by a woman. So uh, that that's, uh, as far as I can tell, that's the reasoning. Okay. Elena, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, but isn't there a branch of the liberal Catholic church that accepts women? There is, it, it split it off from us uh, in the early nineties. Uh, and I don't know how they're doing. Uh, I, I, we don't have any contact with them. It's, they're primarily in Europe. I have um, another question. But, <clears throat> Ned Bitter was involved both in the liberal Catholic Church and in co-masonry. And uh, he always pushed for women to participate in masonry. And he always said there is no reason why women shouldn't participate in mm -hmm. co-masonry. But obviously he didn't do that with the liberal Catholic Church. So maybe he saw, he saw that, you know, the ritual in masonry is fine for both genders, uh, but not the priesthood in the liberal Catholic Church. And I believe that there are, there, there used to be rituals that were designed for female bodies. Uh, many of those we have lost because of the patriarchal society. But. Elena, you were saying something else? Oh, uh, a separate question. I'm curious about the concept of Jesus. So in the Roman Catholic Church is the only begotten son, part of the Trinity. Um, and yet, you know, I wonder if with the theosophical input, especially from Leadbeater, there might be a different view of Jesus, more like the Christ, as in the Christ principle, the Buddhic principle being the, the other term for it, or Christ being an adept maybe, or is it just very similar to the regular Christian concepts? It may be all of those things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, I have questions about it also, but uh, to me, Christ is light, spiritual light. And uh, When you experience that, all the rest of those questions are kind of immaterial, um, not important. Okay, go ahead, Robert. Yes, I think I could uh, maybe add something to that. And I agree with Jim that all of those things are undoubtedly true. And I think it's important to realize that the liberal Catholic church is uh, intended as a kind of religious, Christian religious component of theosophy. And theosophy, of course, uh, recognizes that the ancient wisdom can be expressed through many religions and many vehicles, it is. And we certainly, in the liberal Catholic Church, do not deny that or believe that we are the exclusive custodians of it, rather simply that it's a expression, a vehicle of the ancient wisdom and the spiritual power that um, works for us, maybe because of our own religious background or whatever, but it, 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 um, it is effective in our, own, in our own lives and experience. I myself, anyway, think that um, the, all of the traditional Christian doctrines and expressions like the Trinity, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and so on, or Christ is the incarnation of God, are uh, kind of human ways of expressing the way in which we as individuals have experienced God, which is far beyond any particular conception or even any words or forms that, that we can operate on the, with on the human level. So it's, uh, it's not to be seen as exclusive, but simply as a way of expressing our experience of the, of the divine. And um, uh, I think that, as Richard said, it, it can express itself through the sacraments of the church and does I see them as kind of like lenses or uh, channels that can direct them but not exclusively so of course so uh, I would say that uh, Christ is certainly seen as um, 
one of the adepts, masters, and so on, from the theosophical point of view. At the same time, uh, it can also represent a kind of symbolic expression of the divine working on the human level and in his words and deeds and so on, expressed in the gospels and does that as well. And also can be an expression of the spiritual power that is generated here and now today in the Eucharist and the other sacraments. Yeah, I would say that um, I think that the, uh, the question you asked uh, is really uh, best answered by the, the term liberal in the, uh, in the church, uh, in that, um, uh, I mean, liberal best applies to the way we would perceive and interpret Jesus, and in that uh, we would be very, very much open to all different manners of interpreting and understanding uh, what all the different aspects of Christ are in, in symbolic terms and also in, in literal ways. We would be very much open to um, theosophical concepts and how they apply to Christ, um, as well as um, um, uh, Eastern, Eastern styles of thinking, um, as well as the traditional Roman style as well. I think in, in that way, we are liberal. So do you have a theology like written down that is, even if not enforced, is proposed or, or not? Well, certainly nothing enforced. Um, uh, that we do have a statement of principles, I believe. Uh, that might come closest to what you're asking. I don't think there is no like uh, interpretation of all these, these different concepts because they, there are two possibilities. There is an interpretation suggested by the church but not imposed on people and people are free to interpret it differently or there is no interpretation and people are free to interpret. So what, what is the case? Is there a proposed interpretation of all these things? I would say so. Um, I would say that that's something that uh, I, I don't know how to answer this question. Maybe Jim, maybe you can answer. I would say that uh, that's something we're we're constantly working on. Uh, we're and with every sermon, we're considering uh, new possible interpretations uh, and presenting them to the congregation. Um, uh, Jim, there is there is a. a a printed series of principles, aren't there? Well, and here's something that I'm finding in this booklet that deals a little bit with this. It says the liberal Catholic Church is inspired by an intense faith in the living Christ, believing that the vitality of the church expands in proportion as its members strive to serve together as a vehicle of the eternal Christ, rather than merely commemorate the events and effects of his incarnation 2,000 years ago. It accepts literally his marvelous promise made at the time, though I am with you always to the close of the, of the age. And further, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. This promise validates all forms of Christian worship that are earnest and true, whether they be Catholic or nonconformist. Yeah, that's a statement. So I, I was curious if there are statements like that about the different theological points. Right. Any um, other questions? Uh, I have a question for any of the speakers. All right. Um, I don't know, maybe it's similar to what Pablo was asking, but I was wondering um, if you could explain a little bit more or, or give the background of man's ethical relations within the uh, liberal Catholic Church. Man's ethical relations. It's one of the principles. Right. Um, well, 
first of all, we, we accept the validity of other religions. Uh, we don't feel that this is the no plus ultra or, or the only one. Uh, we feel that the Holy Spirit has inspired teachers in all the major religions. Uh, so that partly answers your question, but we also need to develop internally our relationship to the Christ power. That's an ethical responsibility we have and to recognize it in others. Uh, so we have to be ethical to ourselves, to the Christ, to other people, to the animals, to the world, to nature, uh, everything. We're all, all one. <laughs> We're all one thing. Yeah, and a very important central tenet in Christianity is, of course, love. And we have, uh, we have a system uh, in which different scheduled days uh, throughout the year have special intents uh, that are used as a, um, a guide, especially for helping us to write sermons, but also for uh, the people interested to contemplate on. And a lot of them have to do with um, self-improvement uh, for uh, preparing ourselves to open up for uh, the, the spirit of Christ to enter into us and also uh, to better our, our honesty and compassion and love for all of our neighbors uh, in all of their forms, animals as well as people, um, to love our enemies and to uh, embrace their different viewpoints in our own hearts and to love the, even the people that, uh, that, uh, that we find the, the hardest to deal with. Robert? I think it's important to note that um, the, in the ordinary Eucharist, the liberal Catholic Church does not use the traditional creeds, the Apostles and Nicene Creed of many other churches, although it recognizes them and it, once in a great while can use them, but it has a, a shorter creed developed, I think, by Leadbeater. I don't have it in front of me, so if I can give the exact words, maybe one of you can. But yeah, I know it. That God is we believe that and, God is love and power and truth and light. The perfect justice rules the world. That all His sons shall one day reach His feet, however far they stray. We believe the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man. We know that we do serve Him best who best serve our brother man, and shall his blessing rest on us, and peace forevermore. Amen. Very good. That certainly expresses, I think, the, the ethical message of the church. What, what was the part about perfect justice? Perfect, perfect justice. Just, yeah, we believe that perfect justice rules the world. That doesn't mean, of course, just in this one life. It means taking into account karma and the whole vast progress of evolution in which we hope things will come out right in the end. Yeah, we certainly understand and know that there is by no means perfect justice in our world right now, but that ultimately on the most vast, um, you know, e eternal level, there is a perfect justice. It's called karma. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes, very much so. Uh, Jim, you said that you follow all the sacraments. So is there confession in the church? And how do you do that? I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you said. Uh, yeah. If you follow all the sacraments, do you have a confession service? You know, the absolution of sins and how do you practice that you know in the in the roman catholic church you speak to a you can preach things to a priest yes. Et right yeah so we do that we uh sit down with the person uh hear what they have to say uh we can give absolution at the end uh, yeah it's pretty traditional 
but it's not it's also common. though something not very common mm -hmm. in our church uh, we don't require people to give confession before they receive the sacrament mm -hmm. um, we have a prayer of general confession at the beginning of the eucharist and, and we feel that that takes care of 99 percent of the problems that anybody has and and the absolution is given after it in the, in yes. the eucharist Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the Eucharist, yes. Mm -hmm. is, is that something that one of you remembers right now that you could actually recite? The no. absolution? Oh, go no, ahead. No, no, the, the, the prayer. Confession. The, uh, right. The confession. Oh, let me get it here and I'll get it. Confidier. Right now. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would know it if I. Oh, Lord, remember. thou hast created man to be immortal and made him to be an image of thine own eternity. Yet often we forget the glory of our heritage and wander from the path which leads to righteousness. But thou, O Lord, hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are ever restless till they find their rest in thee. Look with the eyes of thy love upon our manifold imperfections and pardon all our shortcomings, that we may be filled with the brightness of the everlasting light and become the unspotted mirror of thy power in the image of thy goodness, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Ask a, a question um, because, and I know Annie Besson talks about it in the Christianity book, that um, there was a break from reincarnation or there was a separation or reincarnation was lost. Yes. I think at, at Nicaea. Is that, um, so how does the liberal Catholic church approach all that? And is it something that um, you follow more? Because that kind of uh, talks about, you know, outside of God who's in heaven, it's beyond that. Do, do you... Well, you know, I mean, this is your whole. Well, our, our members are free to, to accept or reject the idea of reincarnation, just as a member of the TS is free to accept or reject it. Um, it's often presented at our at our pulpits, a discussion of it a little bit, but uh, it's not a teaching of the church per se. Uh, but we don't. Uh, we don't anathetize it either. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's acceptable to d to discuss and to learn about. Thank you. Mel, have any burning questions? Well, since you mentioned burning, <laughs> any, any idea of? Uh, <laughs> Condemnation, you know, damnation, <laughs> temporary, or something like that. No, we, we, no, I don't think so. That doesn't ever come up. <laughs> you guys must not have many sinners. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we believe that, uh, uh, in effect. Damnation or condemnation is simply separation from God, and that is something that really pertains to the individual. You know, if you separate yourself from God in effect by your actions, your thoughts, your uh, deeds, then uh, you know that can go on, not necessarily eternally, but until you have a change of heart. But uh, we certainly don't believe, as many Christians nowadays do not, in uh, absolutely eternal damnation without any any hope. Yeah, I think yeah. the creed that you uh, said, there was a part that was no matter how far we go astray, yeah. and we come back, mm -hmm. stuff like that. True. Yeah, I think there's, we wouldn't think that there's anyone who cannot uh, win the kingdom of heaven. There is no one who could ever be beyond hope. There are many who've fallen very far astray, um, but uh, there's, 
there's never anyone without hope. Everyone has, a, you know, uh, God within them. And sometimes it may be buried deeply, but it's always there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you guys very, very much. Very Anne Amin, thank you. I didn't know you were a server. So uh, we appreciate your input. Yes. Her yes, brother was a priest, her, her, her husband, James, I mean, was James a priest or a deacon? No, he was a priest. James was a priest, yeah, okay. Right. So yeah. she was surrounded by him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I would say also, um, if any of you are interested in learning more and you're here in Ojai, you're certainly all most welcome to come in person to our church uh, this Sunday. Um, I will be the celebrant and uh, my dad will be our preacher. The, uh, my family's coming to Ojai this weekend. So you're all most welcome. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Susan, you had a comment or question. I was just wondering about cremation and, and the liberal Catholic view on that. I think we generally would prefer, we prefer cremation, but uh, we can perform funeral services for, uh, for burials as well. Mm -hmm. If you want to be, have your remains lodged at the church, you can only do it with cremation. We don't have room for caskets. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> we just... So so you have people's uh, cremains there. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Fact, they have their ashes in our in our memorial garden. Oh. Prime yeah. prime Ojai land. No room for caskets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's terrible did... growing roses though. The roses yeah. don't like like the roots and all those ashes. Mm. Um, like, oh, Richard, you forgot to plug uh, the uh, the audio visual version of our service. Oh yes, yes. Well, any of you who are interested uh, on seeing what it looks like but you can't make it, um, you can go to our church's website and uh, watch our live stream. Uh, it's ourladyandallangels.org. Not of, all, all, Our Lady and All Angels. Isn't that what I said? All, yeah, sorry, Our Lady and all angels. I'll, I'll put the link, like they say in all the YouTube videos, down below. <laughs> and you can click on that to get there. All I right. just want to ask, is your Wednesday night service online? Do you do that online now during the no. pandemic? No, we haven't, started, we haven't restarted them yet. We will eventually get them going. Yeah, so I'll put the website. Um, down below. Yeah, okay. and uh, there's a place you can put in your email address in the website if you want to get my my weekly bulletin. It basically just announces the upcoming service. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very thank you much, much, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. yes. All right, all right. Next week, we will work on um, Annie Besant's The First Half of Christianity in her chapter. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Great. And